Hi guys, I'm Adam Stevenson. I'm a solution architect here at SW. Um, I um, love going out and working with teams and building great teams and awesome software. Um, one of my favourite things I get to do is actually run um, Fire Bootcamp, which is a nine-week intensive. Um, we've got a bit of our, we've got alumni here. I saw Craig out in the audience. Um, nine-week intensive bootcamp where you come in and you work 10 or 12 hours a day for nine weeks, and at the end of it. You, uh, you come out awesome and you've shipped a real world piece of software. So I love doing that every year. Um, one of the best things about this job is I get to use new technology and you know, do greenfield projects on, on the cutting edge. Um, it's great being on the cutting edge. And we, so we've, I've done two projects on ASNet, uh, ASP.NET 5 that are now in production. I started one on beta 4 and one on beta 8. Um, and both of those went live, which is pretty awesome. Um, it wasn't easy though, and I got uh, I was chatting to so Julian asked the question, "Is it ready to do yet?" And it was actually ready. So even from ASP, even from Beta Four, it was still Beta Four itself was actually stable, um, as, and it was it was fine to work on then as long as you had a high pain threshold. Um, <laughs> and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Is where and so the whole point of this talk is to tell you you should absolutely be doing it because it's awesome. If you're starting a new project today, this is definitely what I'd be doing. So I'm going to tell you why you should be doing that. And I'm going to tell you the pain that I had um, and how to, get around, how to get around that pain. And I've got a question from down the back. I was just going to say that they've just renamed it to ASP.NET 4. I was going to say, this could be the shortest presentation in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in .NET history because I, my talk tonight is on ASP.NET 5. And this came out today, ASP not 5 is dead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I saw, the, I saw the heading and I thought, uh oh. <laughs> okay. But so, and this is a bit controversial, this is a, a little bit controversial, but I think it makes a lot of sense because, you know, the title of this talk is ASP net 5 debamboozled. And there is a lot of bamboozlement around um, getting into this. And what this announcement is saying is, um, ASP.NET 5, they've renamed, the, uh, they've renamed the core part. So there's two parts to um, the current version. Um, and I'll talk more about how that renaming affects it. So don't worry, the whole thing's not dead. There's just been some renaming involved. Okay, so I'm just going to do a quick trip down memory lane. Okay, so a few of us have been in the, the web development business for a while. So we remember creating web applications using CGI. And, you know, we all loved front page. And then we did classic ASP. And all of our friends using VB6 would mock us because they had like event handlers and stuff. And so then ASP.NET web forms came along and we thought it was the best thing in the world. We could drag and drop a button and double click it and get an event handler. And that was a whole big change for us. It was a completely new way of working and we had to get a whole new mindset, learn a whole lot of new technology. But it was incredibly awesome and there's no way we'd go back. But after a few years, everyone hated web forms. And we had 2000, Visual Studio 2008. And in around 2010, we got MVC. And we started getting things like the Entity Framework. We started, as a .NET community, focusing on things like dependency injection and unit testing. And if you remember back to that 2010-2012 part, I was doing web forms and all the cool kids were talking about, I'm dependency injecting and I'm doing my unit tests and I'm starting to talk about continuous deployment and now I'm doing MVC. And you're, all your crazy double clicking and event handling is so old fashioned and I felt like my brain was gonna explode. You know, there was so much new stuff and I had to know it because it's what was going forward. And I thought, wow, this is a lot to learn. And who found that phase, that show was around for that phase and thought it was a little overwhelming? Yeah. Yep. So, guess what? We're there now. This is where we're at again. Everything has, everything has changed. This is the, the new version of .NET, of building web applications in the .NET stack is very, very different. But the same way that we look back at ASP.NET Web Forms and there's like, there is no way I'm going back to that. I would rather poke my eyes out than go and do, I find you on a Web Forms project. I feel like that now when I look back at how I was developing web apps. The new tooling's amazing and the way we build really rich JavaScript, you know, great client 
um, JavaScript applications, the tooling, our methodologies, everything around it is so wonderful, but you've just, there's, there's, there is a bit of pain involved in getting there. Um, so here we are now, we've got ASP.NET 5, which may not be called necessarily ASP.NET 5. Um, I'm going to run you through the cool new features. Okay, it's an amazing time when the Microsoft team, they've looked at Visual Studio and instead of going, we need to build great JavaScript tooling so we can build Angular applications and really rich JavaScript applications, they haven't gone and built all of their own tooling around it. They've looked at the, Java, the other JavaScript communities and said, what is the best tooling that is being used at the moment? Because we're going to build that into our IDE. Okay, so they've done a really great job of implementing things like Node Package Manager and Bower and Gulp so that all of these JavaScript frameworks and tooling that have evolved you know, alongside the, the Microsoft stack have all been incorporated into ASP.NET 5. So it really is, build, it makes building ASP.NET 5 applications a pleasure. The whole shift of the focus of Microsoft, who feels it's, there's a, who's felt the, the, a massive shift in the last couple of years? You know, it's not an us and, it's, it's not a competition anymore. You know, we see Google and Angular. You know, the Angular team is now using TypeScript from Microsoft in the next version of Angular. You know, Microsoft's out there and where, you know, the .NET Core is now shipping in the next version of Enterprise Linux Red Hat. Okay, so that, they're shipping Red Hat with .NET Core out of the box. Okay, Microsoft and Linux and Apple, everyone seems to be playing nicely now, which is great. So, you know, so an ASP.NET 5 is really embracing that open source cross-platform environment. Um, so ASP.NET 5 is going to run on Linux. And this was the announcement when they said ASP.NET 5 is dead, okay? So this is something that's important to understand, is that at the moment we had the .NET Framework 4.6. This is the new big .NET Framework that we've all been working with. It, this is what we know and love, okay? Now, there was this new thing called .NET Core 5 or ASP.NET Core 5, and that is a very cut down version of the .NET framework, okay? The wonderful thing about it is it'll run on Windows, Linux, and OS X, okay? So you can file new ASP.NET project and run it on your Linux box or run it, on, uh, run it directly under OS X, okay? Which is a massively, you know, um, it was raised earlier, as far as scalability and cost goes, that's really, really exciting. So what the new announcement is though, is that it's no longer going to be called ASP.NET 5 because it is, even though it's the next version, they didn't want you to feel like it was bigger and better because .NET Core is definitely a subset, okay? And at the moment, we don't think it's ready to, like we're definitely watching it. We think it's massively exciting, but we're not going to build production applications on, the, on .NET, ASP.NET Core yet because it doesn't have everything that we need, okay? So we're definitely building on the, the new full framework, but not on ASP.NET Core 1. So it's not called .NET Core 5 anymore. They've said it's really a whole new version of a new um, platform. Does that, does that simplify that idea for people? Yep. Oh, sorry, can you... I might. And do you want to talk to the camera? Oh, okay. Come up here. Oh, that's why that's now that now I now I understand. Uh, sorry, I'm I'm a. Oh no, you just took. So I'm a bit confused. When you said ASP.NET 5 has you have do done two applications which are in production with ASP.NET 5, you would uh, you would have used .NET Core, right? Or you would have the framework was 4.6 itself. That, so when you go file new project in, in ASP.NET now, by default, it will actually reference two frameworks. It'll reference, so the question was, um, I mentioned that there was two frameworks and when I create a new project, what does it do essentially? So when I go file new ASP.NET project now, by default, it will target two different platforms. It'll target the .NET Framework 4.6 which is our full 
um, um, our full entity framework that we all know and love. And it'll also target the .NET Core. Okay? The first thing I do when I create a new um, ASP.NET 5 application is delete the reference to .NET Core. Just because it's not ready yet. But by default, out of the box, it will target both. Does that, does that answer the question? But because .NET Core is only a subset, it, I, it's not ready. I want to use a lot more features than it currently has, so I remove it at the moment. But I can't wait till maybe the end of 2016, once the .NET Core has expanded enough that we can use it in production, because then I'll be pulling out the full framework just targeting .NET Core, and I'll be able to run my web apps on Linux and on OS X and on Windows. And they're going to be faster on Windows. And they'll be faster on Windows. Who thinks that's cool? Who, who th yeah, most of the room. Excellent. Um, so they're the, they're, I see those as the, the, the super key features. Um, we've now got dependency injection out of the box in ASP.NET, which has always been a bit of a bugbear of mine, is that you know, we, could always do AS, we could always do dependency injection in um, previous versions of ASP.NET, but it wasn't there by default. And when it's not there by default, we're not telling people you have to be doing this. Um, it was something that people had to discover and learn and do themselves. So now that it's there out of the box, I'm hoping every sample from Microsoft highlights the fact. I want the home controller to have dependencies injected so that people have to go, why is it doing this? Oh, that's dependency injection. I should learn a little about that. Because um, I think that's one of the, the one practice that every, you know, everyone should be doing, that, that I see highly underutilized. In previous versions of ASP.NET, we had two different controllers. Okay, we had an, a controller for MVC and a controller for the web API. In the next version, we now have one controller to rule them all. <laughs> okay, so, so that's a great thing, because it wasn't just the fact that there was controllers, there was different pipelines underneath those controllers. So that simplified a lot of things for us. David. With um, the structure, or the, with the dependency injection, how do you feel it compares with some of those things like inject or unity or structure ah, and stuff? The question was, how do I feel that the dependency injection that comes out of the box compares to the, 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 um, the containers that we currently use, like Ninject and Autofac and Structure Map? And it doesn't. And it's not meant to. It's a very, very lightweight container. And I think everybody will plug their own in. But what they've done is, is they've said, we are going to provide a very lightweight container that has minimal functionality out of the box, and we expect you to do dependency injection out of the box. Go and do it your, go and use your own container to do it right. But I think that, and I think that's exactly the right. I think that was a great approach from the Microsoft team. Does, does that answer your question? And which is your favourite? I love Autofac. Yeah, but you know, it's. I'm expecting you know pe people will disagree. People all have their own, but I think a lot of the guys. Um, uh, love it. They love the simplicity about it. They love that it's, it's powerful and simple, and it's uh, built by Brisbane boy. Represent. <laughs> um, so, unit testing. We, who uses NUnit? Yeah, NUnit's awesome. Um, the the testing framework that used to ship with .NET was MS Test. There was with a lot of people loved NUnit because MS Test didn't have all the features that they needed. Um, but so other people would use NUnit. The problem with that was is that then getting your tests to run on your build server and you know, putting NUnit through your whole pipeline was then, you know, there was extra work involved. So now that it, we've upgraded and now um, we've got, we're using XUnit, which is actually, it was um, put together by the guy who wrote NUnit version two, um, which is fantastic. So this is, my, this is one of my pet peeves from, that you couldn't do in MS test, um, was the test case um, attribute that let us have a simple test method and actually pass in multiple parameters. Okay, so I loved this. And this is the main reason why I used NUnit on every project um, that MS test didn't handle. And we've now got, the, it's, so it's called theories in, uh, in XUnit. So I'm really, I'm really happy about that. Um, so they're the main things that have been, that I feel that have been added into the next version of ASP.NET. Um, they've pulled a few things, okay? So there's a few things where they've gone no longer required. I don't think anyone's going to be terribly sad that you can't go file a new web forms project. Um, there were some people upset that they pulled support for VB.NET. So those four guys made such a big noise. <laughs> 
that they actually re-added it. No way. Yep, yeah, it, they've re-added it. Oh my it's re god. It's re-added. But there is a lot of people dependent on VB, but I I don't think we necessarily and I you know I'm an ex VB guy, so I still late at night I'll still dim dim something up by you know when I get a little tired. Um, <laughs> but um, I think this is your last, I think they've said, that might have even been on purpose, but I think this is your last warning. I think it's time to learn C sharp. There's billions of lines of code out there, legacy apps that people have to continue to support. Yeah. And they can continue to support them, and, the, and Visual Studio will continue to support them. All they're saying, is, or all they were saying was, is that the new framework isn't going to support it. So they're not supported? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it was like killing access. So yeah. Well, I think they're saying, for the new stuff, you're going to need to learn C Sharp. Um, so in summary, here's my list of what I think the key, the key features are in the next version of ASP.NET. And that's the awesome JavaScript tooling, the fact that it's cross-platform, dependency injection is now comes out of the box. So if you don't do dependency, if, if injecting, if you new up dependencies, it's time to stop, okay? Um, dependency injection out of the box, everyone should be doing dependency injection. We've got one controller to rule them all. Um, we're doing XUnit now, no more web forms, and if you're a VBNet developer, it's time to embrace C Sharp. Oh, sorry? The controller. There was a slide for one controller to rule them all. Yeah, that was the one. Uh, the question was, was there a slide around one controller to rule them all? Yeah, that's what I was saying, that we used to have a web API, con an API controller and a controller for MVC, but now it's just one controller that does, that does both. Um, so they're the cool new features. They're the reasons why I think you should be doing ASP.NET. Oh, TJ's got a question. The question is, am I going to talk about tag helpers? Because and I think that's one of the coolest things. I'm not actually going to talk about tag helpers, which is a new language feature in um, MVC, because um, I'm more talking about what's in the, 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 framework, the, the framework itself. But there are, so that's actually something I did miss, is there is cool new um, language features and syntax. Um, so that's actually a really good point, as I should have had, I should have definitely had that as a slide. There is cool new language features in there as well. MVC is not MVC5, it's MVC6 and... That's it. Yeah. So now we have ASP.NET 5 and MVC6 and .NET Core 1. <laughs> and ASP.NET 5 isn't actually called ASP.NET 5. I'm pretty sure it's... 4.6. It's .NET called. Framework 4.6. And, 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 and that's the... That great, Riddell raises a great point. Um, so Entity Framework 6... Um, so Entity Framework has also been completely rewritten. So at the moment, Entity Framework 6 is the full Entity Framework. Entity Framework 6 does not work with .NET Core. What they've done is they've, re they've rewritten the Entity Framework, um, and it's also changing its name. So it's gone, I think. It's now called... Um, so Entity Framework 6 supported the full... Entity... Yes. So Entity Framework 6 does not support .NET Core. So they re they've rewritten the Entity Framework to support .NET Core. Um, so Entity Framework 7 was the Entity Framework that was going to support .NET Core. So now they've renamed Entity Framework 7 to Entity Framework Core 1. Okay? <laughs> is, is everyone good? <laughs> I think Web API is just going to be Web API. I don't know. The, there's too many versions. Um, but that's, that's, that's where we're at at the moment. Now, I think everyone's... Is, is everyone convinced that a, the next version of ASP.NET is going to be awesome? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Now, there's a lot to get your head around. And this is what hurt with us. It took us a couple of weeks of going, what am I... You know, there are so many things to get my head around. I need to understand, I need to get, everyone's talking about Roslyn and Owen and .NET Core and DNX451 and DNVM and DNU and DNX and Gulp and NPM and Bower. <laughs> and all I did was just go file a new project. 
okay? The first couple of weeks is tough. And that's what I want to do now is I just want to say, here's all the pieces. So at least in your heads, you can go find your project and you know what the pieces are and what they do and what you need to care about, okay? Um, oh, I forgot one, and dub 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 root, also important. <laughs> so when I go file a new project and I create a new ASP.NET web application, I have two options. And obviously this screen is going to change now. So in Visual Studio 2015, I can go in and I can go and choose an ASP.NET 461 template. This is the, the existing released version of ASP.NET. So you, in 2015, obviously you don't need to buy into this new stuff yet. But I think it's time. I think there's, it's not released yet, but if I was starting a new project today, I would be choosing an ASP.NET 5 web application template. Okay? Um, and getting your head around the new things. So the first thing to get your head around is Roslyn. So what's really cool now is that when we, when we update our code in Visual Studio, we can save it and we don't need to build. So we can hit Control S to save our C-sharp changes, flip to our browser, hit F5, and refresh the page and it'll be refreshed. Because what we've now got is a new C-sharp and VBNet compiler that actually comp compiles on the fly. Okay, um, there's a whole lot of things you can do with Roslyn. So we, we write our code auditor pro project. Um, and what it does is it does analysis of your code as you write it, similar to ReSharper, okay? But it's, it's much, much faster and it's running, it's running all the time and it's compiling on the fly. Okay, so if you were going to write a tool, if you are going to go and rewrite your own version of ReSharper, Roslyn is what you would need, is what you would use. Um, ReSharper have actually come out and said though they've written so much code that they're not going to change to Roslyn. But if you're going to write ReSharper today, Roslyn is what you would need, is what you would use. The important thing is though, is that I can code, 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 add a controller, add a method, control S, no need to build, and the, it's compiling on the fly. Jump into your browser and refresh it. No need to build. Who thinks that's awesome? Who, that's going to save you some time, yeah? Yes? The biggest use I found for Roslyn is uh, actually writing your own rules engine because it can compile on the run. You can actually write, say, mm. dynamic rules engine with a very simple logic and it actually can compile to runtime. Yep. So, oh. Sorry. That's right. So what TJ was, what TJ was saying is, is that uh, he found the great use for Roslyn and that's exactly what we do in Code Auditor, is you can write your own rules engine that actually looks through your code and checks it against those rules and tells you whether you're breaking them on the fly. Um, the next thing you need to get your head around is Owen. And Owen's massively important. Um, who, wants to, who wants to tell me in one sentence what Owen does? Self-hosting is one of the things that it does, yes. Who wants to describe what it is? Yeah, I heard, so in, I just did this in Canberra and one of the guys said, what is it, it's an abstraction over your web server. I thought that was a really nice way of, of summarising it. ASP.NET used to be tied directly into IIS. Obviously to go cross-platform, we need a level of abstraction in there. And that's really, you'll, you'll read a lot about Owen and you'll see a lot about Owen. Um, and you can, do, we use Owen a lot. But getting started, don't worry about it too much. Just understand that what it is, is an abstraction from your web server. Okay, so what you're doing is, is it's saying, instead of talking directly to IIS, we're, we're putting an abstraction over things like authentication, okay, and file access. Um, so you can see here the new startup um, CS in ASP.NET 5 is doing things like uh, registering, um, MVC and registering an IOC container, and this is all doing it through, you know, registering things with Owen. Um, there's these, there's these, there's some new terms that come with ASP.NET 5. There's a, we've got a package manager for, or a version manager for ASP.NET 5. So I can jump into a command line. Okay, and, oops. Yeah, sorry, I meant to, Oh. I can no longer. Yep.
Okay. So I can jump into my command line and I can go dnvm. Okay. And this is the .NET version manager. Okay. And it's going to give me all of the commands. So now I can go dnvm list and it's going to show me the versions of .NET that I have installed on my machine. Okay. So I could go along now and I could go dnvm upgrade and go and get the la that will go out and it will check to find what's the latest version of .NET that's available and it will find it, it's checking and then it'll download it and install it on my machine. Okay. So it's actually gone and done that now. Okay. So you've got to get used to using dnvm. Um, the next one that you need is DNX. So we use DNX as the, um, is the runtime that we use. I'm holding off on questions until I finish this slide. Because <laughs> I think it's a few people down the back know what's coming. Um, so DNX is our, is our runtime environment. So that's what we use to execute um, the next version of uh, ASP.NET. And we've got DNU, which is our development utility. So I can come in and I can do things like if I wanted to publish my application, I could come in and do DNU publish, okay, and that's going to compile it and output the, um, and publish it out to a location that then I can use. I can go and restore my NuGet packages by going DNU restore. Okay, so when I've been doing this presentation for the last couple of months, those things have been really important to learn. And if you're doing file new project today, you should definitely go and learn them. Okay. However, we are in a changing world, and ASP.NET is only in RC1. And even in a release candidate, things can change. And this all changes in RC2. So if you're starting today, you need to go and learn these things. If you're going to be starting in a month, you're probably going to, it's going to be a little different. Um, so this is when we go file new project. This is what we see. So underneath our web application, we can see references to DNX451, which is our full, uh, our full, AS, uh, our full .NET framework. And we can see a reference to DNX Core 1. Okay, so that's going to be DNX Core 1 in the ASP.NET Core 1 in the future. Okay. Um, so the DNX Core is the cross-platform .NET library that can run on other platforms. But at the moment, we're not going to target it by default. Okay, it's not ready yet. And DNX 451 is the current full framework that we all know and love. Um, DNX is what we can use to target different platforms, and you can go, oh, you know, you can go into the properties of the project and choose where you're targeting. Now, who uses a package manager? What's our favourite package manager, .NET people? NuGet. <laughs> NuGet, and that's what we use to add. Pro that's what we use to add packages to our project, right? Isn't it awesome having packages? One of the great things about ASP.NET um, Next is that everything is a package, okay? So every, all of the .NET dependencies you bring down are now packages. Um, there are problems with NuGet. Who's, who, who, who's had the issue where they've gone and they've, tr they've added a NuGet package for something? So I had this problem with Moment, okay? I added Moment as, as a NuGet package and there was a bug. So if, for those that don't know, Moment is a great um, uh, JavaScript library for working with dates and times. Um, so I added to my project via NuGet. The problem was there was a bug in it, and I had looked. The bug had been fixed on GitHub, but the NuGet package hadn't been updated for a couple of months. I'm like, oh, okay. So who's had that pain? Yeah. Um, so then what I did was I removed the package. I went to GitHub. I downloaded it and put it straight into my application. Um, and it's not great for. There's no tool for bundling the front end. Okay. The, we had the MVC bundler. What is it? Wasn't really good enough. And really, NuGet is just for Visual Studio developers. No one else in the world is using NuGet. Okay? So what the Visual Studio team has done, or the ASP.NET team has done, is they've decided, let's look at what the JavaScript community is doing. And Bower is, um, what the, is, was created by Twitter. And what it does is it allows us to get front-end libraries, so all of our JavaScript libraries, things like Moment, Bootstrap, Angular, jQuery, what it does is it's going to, the same way that NuGet pulls down NuGet packages from our NuGet servers, Bower is going to go out to GitHub and it's going to download the source code from GitHub into our project as a package, okay? which is pretty awesome. And the nice thing about this it is it's, it's used by all of the JavaScript community. 
And to get it to use it in your ASP.NET application is super easy. All we need to do is jump in. We can go into our application and we can find our bower, um, our bower.json. Uh, that's a great question. The question is, why do I have all this red squiggly lines? And this, the answer is, this is a real world project. Um, it's a real world project that's behind a firewall that I can't access at the moment. So I actually can't update a few things. So it's actually not compiling because it's a real world project. I can only get update from when I'm on that promise premise. Um, but what, what I can do is I can come in here and I can say, I want to get this package. I want to get Angular. It's going to show me the... I could get Angular Bootstrap, or I could go and get Angular Accounting. I didn't know there was an Angular Accounting bow package. I'm going to go in. It'll prompt me the version, the latest version that's available. I can choose it. And when I hit Save, it's actually going to go out. It's going to you can see it's gone out. It's gone to GitHub. It's downloaded it, and it's added it into my project. OK? Pretty cool. So now we've got two package managers. Who thinks that's a great thing? Yeah, me too. Um, so before, we used, for things like Moment and jQuery, we used NuGet. Um, and we used M things like ASP.NET MVC, we also used for U NuGet. We're not doing JavaScript libraries using NuGet anymore. Instead, we're going to use Bower. Cool? Awesome. So that's where we went and had a look at adding it. So we're only going to use ASP.NET. We're only going to use NuGet now for our stuff that contains C-sharp code. Now, because package managers are amazing, we thought, let's get another package manager. <laughs> OK? So there's a great package manager that all the JavaScript backend guys, all of the Node guys use. And it's called the Node Package Manager. And there's a whole lot of Node packages around that do great things like copying files, minifying files, bundling up JavaScript files, OK? And when the ASP.NET team was looking and going, how are we going to handle the bundling story? How are we going to handle the minification story? They looked at NPM and they thought, they looked at that there's, you know, there's thousands of packages used by millions of people. And they went, let's not do our own. Let's use the best tooling that's out there already. <coughs> so now we've got a third package manager to use. And where NPM really comes in is for things like mon um, minification, for taking our less and converting it to CSS, taking our TypeScript and turning it into JavaScript. Anything that's tooling related, okay, we're going to use doing NPM now. Okay? So, and once again, it's, it's very easy to use. So I can jump into my project. I can go into my package.json. So Bower used Bower.json. NPM uses package.json. And I can come in here and go, oh, OK. I want to I get something that does, I'm just going to have a look at what I can get. Um, I'm going to come in and I'm going to get something that compiles TypeScript. So I'm going to go in, I'm going to get gulp TypeScript. I'm going to go and it'll tell me my version numbers. And I can go and choose my version. Everyone must be on the Wi-Fi. I can hit Save, and it will download it. It'll get that package from NPM. That's not doing it. Um, it'll download it, and it'll add it to my project. OK? So now what, it, so now what I've got is I've got, um, three package, I've got three package managers. I've got NuGet for C-sharp code. I've got NPM for our JavaScript tooling, and I've got Bower for our um, client-side JavaScript. Um, we also got a nice new NuGet package manager, which because um, now it's got to compete against all the other package managers. You know, they wanted to at least make it spiffy. Okay, um, so Bower for Java front end. Does that make sense to everybody? NPM for doing all of our operations on our JavaScript, and we've got still got good old NuGet for our .NET dependencies. There is a bit of an issue, is that Bower is awesome. And all of the projects that you are working with at the moment are all using Bower. Um, there is, I shouldn't say Bower is dead, but I just like that picture of the bird. That there, is, there is a lot of people who are now using, um, are using uh, 
uh, NPM instead of Bower. So you'll actually see on our ASP.NET 5 music store that Adam announced earlier tonight, we're actually not using Bower at all. Okay, so Bower, Bower is great and a lot of people are using Bower very, very successfully. Um, and we've used it in all of our projects to date and it's great. Um, so this is one of those areas where have a look at Bower, have a look at doing, have a look at our music store and then decide which way you want to go. Um, now we've got all of these JavaScript packages that we're downloading using Bower or NPM. What am I going to do with them? Now I'm writing, who's writing TypeScript? What? How can I, who's writing TypeScript? Big hands, only three people, four people in the room. Okay, that's very surprising. Who's writing lots, who's writing hundreds of lines of JavaScript? Okay, you all need to go and learn TypeScript. Um, the, so this is a bit of an aside, but we use TypeScript on all of our projects because once you're writing a lot of JavaScript, you need type safety. It makes a massive difference. Um, if you're gonna move from Angular 1 to Angular 2, even the Angular team from Google have decided that TypeScript is the language to use. So Angular 2 uses TypeScript by default. Okay? The drama with TypeScript in your project is your TypeScript has to be compiled into JavaScript. Okay? Um, so we need to compile our TypeScript into JavaScript. We use less. A lot of people use SAS. We need to, con to, comp we need to um, con compile our less and SAS into CSS. We want, to, we want to do things like linting. We want to check our JavaScript to make sure it works. We want to, there's a whole lot of tasks that we want to do with, to do with our JavaScript in our front end. So we don't need to go shift control B anymore, which is pretty cool, but we do need a build process for our JavaScript now. Okay? Um, and the way we're doing that is we're using a cool tool called Gulp. Okay? So Gulp is really awesome. Um, when You'll, I've got the slide up still for Grunt. So in the early, ver the very first betas, um, we used Grunt. And what Grunt did um, is the same thing as Gulp, but it was slower and it was more configuration based, where Gulp is more code based, okay? So what we can do is, you can see this little snippet of code here. What we can use Gulp to do is we can say, let's go and compile our less and output it to CSS, okay? So if I just have a little look at this snippet, it's calling a gulp task. It's going and looking in a folder. So this is in a config. This is an, a, um, uh, in our config, we've got a property called all less, where we're pointing to the folder that all the less is in. And it's saying, get all of my less, output it to our plumber, which is just our, um, uh, uh, which we use for logging, and then call the less method to convert the less into CSS. And then once we've got that, output it, to the destination folder, which is our CSS folder, okay? That's what we did have. Oh, what is auto prefixer is a great question. We didn't have auto prefixer in there originally. What we were doing is we were going and we were getting all of our less, which wasn't just from us, it was from other people as well. And we were compiling it down into CSS, but we were actually getting um, conflicts because we were using the same class names as other people. So what I did is I had to go and I had to go and get a package that would save me getting those conflicts. Where did I go and get the package from? NPM. I went and got an NPM package called Auto Prefixer. I added it into my what file? Packages.json. Packages it went and it went and downloaded that package. And then I could jump into my gulp file and say, now call Auto Prefixer. And what that did was it just prefixed each of the um, CSS classes that we're doing with a prefix that made them all unique. Okay? So now this is how I'm building my this is how I'm building my JavaScript. Okay, and building my less and building my SAS and building my TypeScript. Who thinks that's cool? Yep. So we don't need to compile C sharp, but we need to compile JavaScript now. What a crazy world. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, remove the white spaces. And that's in that, so we're doing all of our things like bundling and minification doing that. So I'm just going to jump in quickly and I'm just going to show you through some of the real world things that we're doing in a real world gulp file. Okay. Um, I'm not going to go all the way through this, but there's some pretty cool stuff in here. Um, so I'm going to jump back up the top. I'm just going to call out some of the things that is going on. 
I have got present mode on. If I can get up there. Control Q to. Huh. Yeah, it's already in presenter mode. Do you want to make it? I'll make it bigger. Um, okay. Um, uh, so what? We, so the question was. Oh, so I'll run. I'll come. I'll come to that. So. What we're doing is, so what we can do is, what we're doing with Gulp is we're creating a number of Gulp tasks. So we're taking down the process of what we need to do to convert all of our front end stuff and build it into a form that then can be served out to users, okay? So the first thing we do is we go through and we clean up the stuff that we compiled last time, okay? So I've got some tasks for that. So you can see here where delete my CSS. So I've got a Gulp task called clean dubdubroot dash CSS. Now, I can execute that by going into the Task Runner Explorer, going down to that task and hitting clean the CSS. Okay, I can go into that and say run, and you can see over, if I went and showed you on the right-hand side, you would be able to see it deleting that folder. Okay? What we tend to do, what I like to do more, is I love running this stuff from the command line. Okay? Oops. Do I already have one running? Why? Um, because, I'll show you in a minute, because when I come in here, when I, so I can come in here and I can go gulp, and it's, oh. now when I go and type gulp by default in this project, it's going and doing everything I need to do, okay? Actually, that's the other project. I'm going to come into this project. Okay, I'm going to come into this project and I'm going to type gulp. And what it's going to do is it's telling me the gulp tasks that I have available. Okay, so I have a task called copy, help, watch, wire dep. I have tasks called clean. I have a number of clean tasks. I can compile my list, compile my TypeScript. I can copy my Angular templates. I can lint my TypeScript and my JavaScript. Cool? So I can come in here and go gulp, compile, Compile less. Oh, if I typed it right, that's going to go and it's going to look at all my less and you can see it's actually co compiling it out to CSS. Okay? I can go gulp compile TypeScript. Okay, that's taking my TypeScript and compiling it, right? So what I've got, so I've got a whole lot of these modular tasks and then I've bundled them all up together sequentially so I can go Gulp copy. So that, and I've just made that name up. And you can see now it's doing my whole front end build process. It's cleaning my app folder, which is where all my, my Angular files are. It's cleaning my Angular template. It's copying my Angular templates. It's generating my TypeScript references, compiling my TypeScript. Um, oops. It's co compiling my less. It's compiling my, cu my custom less. It's cleaning my Bower. It's publishing my Bower components to www.root. And it's calling YDEP, which is really cool. And I'm just going to call that out in a second. Um, and this is YDEP is one of the cool reasons why you do use Bower. Um, and then we're injecting our JavaScript and CSS into the template. Okay? So I've got a whole front end build process going on here. And I'm just going to call out a couple of things that are really cool. And you might have seen where we're do using YDEP. Okay? And how that works is that, you know when you add a new JavaScript library at the moment, what do you need to do? You need to, you need to download it and then you need to put in all your references. We don't have to do any of that. What we do is we just add it into Bower and then Bower downloads it and YDEP actually goes through, I'm just going to show you our YDEP task.
Um, so what's happening here is we're going in and what, what YDEP does is it goes through, it looks at our JavaScript components that we're downloading and it works out what's got to go into, what JavaScript files have got to go into the footer and what CSS files have got to go into the header and it adds them in automatically. Okay, so how it does that is you can see it goes and we've got these header include templates. So it comes in here and you can see we've got underneath our, um, underneath views, shared, we've got these templates. Um, so like header include templates. And they and body include templates, and these are almost empty, okay? But what they've got is these little attributes. So what happens when we build, when we call our gulp task, is it grabs the header include templates, it renames it to layout header includes, okay, and saves it. Then it calls YDEP, and what YDEP does is it goes and gets all of our Bower components, and it works out what CSS is there and what JavaScript is there, and it injects those things into those attributes. Okay, so when you're working with a lot of different JavaScript libraries, Bower and YDEP together is really powerful. Um, so that's how Gulp, that's, that's an overview of, the cool, of what you're going to use Gulp for. Has anyone got questions about Gulp? Who thinks that's pretty cool? Yeah. So what we're going to use Gulp for is we're going to use it for things like uh, minification and uglification, lesson, compiling lesson SAS, um, beautifying and bundling. Um, we can use, I showed you how to use the Task Bundler Explorer. Um, and oh, there's one last thing that I was going to show you. So we've got this build process. So we don't need it, we can hit Control, say, control S now to save our C sharp and we can refresh our browser. Do we really want, if we jump in and go Shift Control B, Watch what happens. It compiles my C-sharp really quick, but then it's got to kick off that gulp process and watch how long it takes to go through all of that. Oh, I'm getting, sorry, I'm getting errors here, so it's not going to kick that off. It can take a minute to go through that whole gulp process. You don't want to do that every time you need to refresh your browser. So what's the answer? You can set a gulp watch, okay? So what, if, if you come in here and you look at the very bottom, you can see down the bottom here, I have a Gulp watch task. Oh. Okay, here we go. Okay, and what Gulp watch does is it says, watch my TypeScript file. And whenever any of the files in my TypeScript folder change, go and call just the small compile TS and generate TS refs. Okay, whenever anything in my less folder changes, call my compile less. And whenever anything under app HTML changes, call this copy Angular templates dirty method. Okay, so it means that I don't have to constantly be calling my full gulp process. And this is the question is, why do I run from the command line? Because I have this command line running all the time on my second monitor. And I just come in here and I go gulp watch. Okay, oh, I'm in the wrong window. I come in here and I go gulp watch. Okay, so now that's just watching those folders. I have that running on my window over here. I come in, I make a change to a, um, I come in here and I make a change to something under my app folder. I'll come in and I'll change one of my, um, something in one of my services. Okay, I can come in here. Oh. Okay, I can make a small change, and you'll see that's automatically kicked off a build of all of my TypeScript. Okay, I just introduced an error, but it's gone through and it's actually compiled it for me. Okay, well that would actually be a good demo if I came in and I did something that won't compile. Because why I like it doing that is when I make a change that won't compile, it actually shows me an error over the side. There we go. My error, the red comes up and I go, oh, I've just made an error. So rather than it running down in the window down the bottom that I'm looking at, it's always in my peripheral vision. Who thinks that's cool? Is there a way you can wait to save what you're doing? Because obviously you're going to go through many transient stages 
mistakes that maybe won't yield anything useful until you get to the bit where you go, good, now I'm finished? Um, well, this is only doing a... So as long as it's compiling, it's, it is continually compiling if you're running a Galt watch. So, but I'm, I'm happy with that because I know if it's in an invalid state and there's errors coming up, I'm fine with that. But, you know, when I hit save and I expect it to save, I can kind of keep an eye on it while I continue the, the next little bit. It just really works in the workflow. What console running? Oh, it's called Commander, C-M-D-E-R. Yep, Duncan got me onto it and it's awesome. Because the question is, what console, um, what command line tool am I running? And what's nice about it, control T, it's actually tabbed, which is really, really handy. You see the tabs down the bottom? Yeah, it's really great. Um, excellent, so we've had a look at the Visual Studio Task Runner. We've looked at, um, so we used to do bundling and minification in, through the MVC pipeline. Now we're doing all of that cool stuff using Gulp. Uh, so I've just got a couple of um, comments from the live streamers. Oh, great. Um, one of them said you didn't call out that the web API has just been renamed to MVC. So there's no such thing as the web API anymore. It's just MVC. Ah. Okay. Yep. Um, and also, um, some guy is saying that uh, NuGet just doesn't work when you have multiple solutions with dependencies between them. That's what he's experiencing. With multiple solutions with dependencies. So that's an interesting. So he's saying that there's. I'd actually say the opposite is that, so he's saying that, um, that NuGet doesn't work when you've got multiple solutions with dependencies between them. We find in really large enterprises that we're in where we're running, you know, we've got one client where we've been in there for over two years. So we've done seven, I think, seven different large enterprise projects for them. So what we do for them is we actually share code between them using NuGet. So we have their, they have their own internal NuGet server. And as we write that code that's supposed to be shared between their different projects, we actually bundle that as um, NuGet packages. And then that's how we do share it between. So I actually find that's a, a great way to work. And in the next version of .NET, all of your class libraries are easily able to be um, compiled as NuGet packages. So NuGet, so I find that. Uh, so if you're listening, I'd actually love to have a little bit more explanation about why you think that's a challenge to the person on the, the stream. Cool, it's great to have them participate. Awesome. Um, the next big change is uh, a little bit sad for guys who love, who, who loves lots of XML? No one. Oh. Soap, that's right. So, so for the soap lover, unfortunately we're not using lots and lots of XML anywhere. No, it's a great thing. So what we've done is we've, we've, all of, we've moved to JSON-based configuration. So we don't have a CS proj anymore. Now we've got a project.json. Um, config.json, so we've got instead of web config, and we've got package.json instead of package.config. Um, so now project.json is where all of our NuGet references live. Um, it's got full IntelliSense and IIS hosting. So I could actually jump in and I can open up a project.json, open up this one. So you can see it's all, it's very readable, it's very straightforward. We can see where we're specifying um, our dependencies. So these are our NuGet packages. We can go and we can specify our commands in here. So this is where at the moment I can kick this, um, our music store, we can actually kick that off um, using DNX by executing the command web. So I can jump to a command line and go DNX web, and it'll actually kick off the Kestrel web server running that application. So now, you could see I could browse to localhost 5000 and I'll be able to view my web app. So we use those commands a lot. So that's a bit dumb. So there's a, the moral of this story is that there's a lot of um, JSON. Everything's moved into JSON-based configuration now. Um, so web config is gone. Um, mostly. <laughs> so here's a, bit, here's a bit of a tip. So you will see in my, I'm, I'm, you might see I'm running, I'm flicking between two different projects here. One project is our music store, uh, which Adam announced, which is available on GitHub, which is our Angular 2 music store, which is where we're putting all of our best practices. The other one is a real enterprise project that I've been working on. Um, and what we found is, is that our building and deployment tooling 
um, isn't yet really, it's still easier to transform config, XML config files than it is to transform JSON files. So in some places we're still putting, configs are still supported and sometimes it's still an option for when you want to transform parameters. So that's, so all of the config is in JSON, uh, sorry, all of our configuration is now in JSON, but the config stuff you can still access. Um, there's a great new concept in ASP.NET and that's the dubdub root folder. And this is a paradigm that's existed in um, other platforms for a long time. Um, and the idea is, is that it gives, us a, it gives us two great things. So when, we, when you go file a new project now, and you create a new ASP.NET project, you'll see there is this dubdub root folder. Okay? And what that is, is that's where we're going to put all of our static content. Okay? In, so in, you know, in, uh, I've seen a lot of JavaScript projects where they call it dist. Okay? And that's where we put, once it's compiled, um, but that's where we put, it's where we put images, it's where we put CSS, it's where we put JavaScript, it's where we put plain HTML files. We don't put anything in there that needs code that needs to be compiled or interpreted. Okay? Um, and where, why that's great in ASP.NET is it's giving a separation between what is a, you know, static content and what is our actual project. So that gives us security. Because when we run our application, that dub dub root, it becomes the root of the application. So nothing outside of that is downloadable. It also gives us a big performance increase because nothing inside that folder is actually processed by IS, it's just directly served. Okay? So what are we going to put in dub 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 root? We're going to put in things like our, you know, our compiled JavaScript, our compiled CSS. Okay? Does that, does that sound like a good idea to everyone? Um, it's where you put all of your static files. So the question was, um, is that where we put all of our static files for pushing to CDNs and things? Um, yeah, so this is where all, basically anything that's static gets put. So if I have a look in our real world project, you can see the things we've put in here are, um, we have our libs, so we had to download Kendo UI is not available from Bower or a public library. You've got to actually install Kendo and add the JavaScript to be downloaded. So because that's just being served directly, we throw it in a libs folder. Angular WYSIWYG is available on, um, is available, um, on GitHub, but there's a bug in it, so we had to download it, fix the bug, and then put it and serve it ourselves. So that's in our libs folder. Images, static content. We serve, put all, serve all of our images directly from www.root. Now, the other ones above here, our CSS, how does our CSS get in there? Gulp task, excellent. Um, underneath app is where we put our, jar, our Angular application. How does it get in there? Gulp, excellent. So we've got down here in the core of the application, you can see I've got an app folder here, and in that app folder is a whole lot of TypeScript. So when my gulp executes, it takes my TypeScript from this folder outside of dubdubroot, compiles it to JavaScript and sticks it up here. It takes my less down underneath content, takes my, my site.less and my bootstrap less, it compiles it to CSS and sticks it up here under CSS. Okay. So the idea is, is that anything under dubdubroot is ready to be consumed by your end users. Okay? Now, there's a bit of a debate here. So this, this is a paradigm that's gone on for ages, and it is considered best practice by lots of people that every time you build your front end, you should just blow that whole folder away, and your front end build process should recreate that folder. And in theory, I'm a fan of that. Um, but when you, so what those people say is that things like images, Images should exist outside of your dubdub root folder, and whenever you compile your front end, it should copy all of those images into your front end folder. So you have, you have nothing in dubdubdub root, it all exists in your application, and when you build, it deletes that folder, recreates it, and copies everything in. Because then it's always clean. Okay? I think that's great in theory, but I was on a project with 200 meg of images, and every time I compiled my front end, I was just copying 200 meg of images from one folder to another folder, and that felt stupid. Um, so the path I like to go down is the one down the middle. So you can see here where, underneath my dubdubroot, I check in my images folder. 
I check in my libs folder because they remember they're the JavaScript libraries that I've downloaded and I'm serving directly. Um, but everything else, so my app and my Bower components, oh sorry, and my C app and my CSS, I'm actually deleting that every time I build my front end and I'm copying it in when I run my gulp file. I'm also doing that with my Bower components. I'm also taking the JavaScript that comes from GitHub, just the JavaScript and CSS, and copying that in underneath the Bower components folder. Are you not versioning it because it's in debug mode? Uh, I'm not versioning it at all in this project. So we actually do it differently when we go to production. Yep. So yeah, so the question is why am I not versioning it? Sorry? No, because it's we, we handle that separately. We handle that the question. So yeah, that's that's kind of a separate topic that I'll come I'll come back to. Um, so that's what the, so that you've got to get the, your head around the dub dub. So that's a new concept to get your head around, but it gives us performance and it gives us a nice separation of code and static content. Um, and it maps to the host name, and you know that's not where we put in anything that needs to be compiled. So here's the stuff from a, the new version of ASP.NET you need to get your head around is that VS 2015 supports the existing version and also the new version. There's no need to compile your backend anymore because of Rosalind, you can just save it. Um, with Owen, it means we're not tied directly into IIS. And with .NET Core, we're not even tied directly into Windows. Um, we've got DNX, DNVM and DNU, um, which you need to get your head around for RC1, but is gonna change in RC2. And we've now got three package managers, which is awesome. So I think the money's to be made in making a package manager for your package managers. So <laughs> <laughs> um, and we've, we don't need to compile our C-sharp anymore, but we need to compile everything else. OK? <laughs> so that's the stuff to get your head around. So hopefully, that gives you an idea of if you're going to start a new ASP.NET project today, you should be using the next version. And hopefully that gives you ideas of what all the moving parts are and what they all do. Um, oh, and you've also got to get, you've also got to use your www.root folder. Um, and we're using JSON everywhere. Um, so I've done two projects, they're both in production. Um, but I'm not going to say I came out of it without any scars. Um, some of the guys on my team might have said some rude words. And what I'm going to try and do now is talk to you about the things that hurt so that you can, you can skip those. Because if you know the answers, you can skip that pain. Um, learning and implementing front-end build, we spent a week on. Because um, there's so many ways to do it. There's so much information out there that said, here is the tool, uh, but not anything that gave us real world how to do it. Okay, so that's why we've gone and created the ASP.NET Music Store because we're saying go and get it and you know, we're going to try and save you the pain that we went through. Okay, so um, definitely go and do that but you've really, you know, learn, learn Gulp. Okay, it's um, Gulp, Gulp is your friend. Um, we had a big issue with going to ASP.NET because the packages, because it was only in early beta, especially around the beta 4 stage, a lot of the .NET libraries that we just assume are going to be available no longer hadn't been updated for the latest version so that's a pain that's really minimized yet any of the the up-to-date packages are already shipping the next versions um, we had some real pain so we did really well like the first month there was a lot of learning but then we got into our routine and we we're loving it we're like Hey, check out all the cool new stuff out. We're building our front end. We're using Roslyn. Look at all this cool stuff that's happening. We're shipped on a great cadence. You know, we're walking around kind of going, you're not using, you're not, you're not building software in a beta version? No, old school. And then we thought, okay, it's time to actually start to not delete the database. And we hand in our board and I'm like, oh, cool. I'll enable code first migrations today and then I'll do that PBI and that PBI. Because how long does it take? To, who uses code first? How long does it take to enable code first migrations? An hour? I thought, I'll do that. And I thought, oh no, there's that thing, that other thing I was going to do. I'll do that, Tiago. You enable the code first migrations. Best thing I did all week. So he spent about three or four days trying to enable code first migrations. It was an absolute shocker. 
Um, and the reason is, is because the way that commands are executed are completely different in the, next, in the next version. So I'm going to save you all days, and you can just all send me coffees. The answer, the, the answer to using code first you, with vnext is use EF7. If, you, if you're happy to use EF7, then it's meant, they're meant to, go, meant to go together. You won't have a drama. If you want to use the current version of um, EF6, because um, you want something like lazy loading, then go and get this package, EF6 commands. It's what you need to work with the existing version of Entity Framework on the next version of ASP.NET. Okay, if, if, some, if I'd found that, we could have saved ourselves a few days. Um, it's also still difficult to reference um, the, uh, the previous version of .NET DLLs. Okay, so that was something we really struggled with, um, even if they're in the same solution. Um, there's issues with accessing HTTP, how you access HTTP context is different, so that's something you've got to get your head around. Um, and so that, that were the real coding issues we found about building the projects. Um, but a lot, of, a lot of these things are getting better and better, like we're at a release candidate now. Um, I found some interesting issues, so if you want to see, if you want to watch some of the issues I'm having, um, because if you can't go to my blog on adamstevenson.com, Okay, you can actually see I've um, I did a blog. I've lost the internet. Looks like. Okay, so there's a lot of. Sometimes you think things are going to work easily. So I work a lot with GitHub. I work a lot with Azure. I love Azure, and I work a lot with ASP.NET. So I thought, what I'll do is I'll create a new ASP.NET project. I'll check it into GitHub. And I'll check out, I'll just set up continuous deployment to Azure. Who's using Azure for their personal websites? Yeah, it's so awesome how easy it is to get an, how easy it is to get a uh, website up and running on Azure. So I thought, cool, I'll just plug it into GitHub. It didn't work. Okay, so if you want to go check out my blog at adamstevenson.com, I highlight there's two big issues. One is that you can't do it on the free tier. You've got to go up to one of the more expensive paid tiers because um, there's not enough size um, to run vNext um, on Azure. And the other one is, is I was trying to serve a web API project. Okay? So does a web API project need, v, uh, need the dub, dub, root, dub root folder? I was just serving API controllers. No, because I'm only putting static content into dub, dub, dub root. So this kind of confused me for a little while. Because once you I had deleted the dub 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 root folder because I didn't need it, um, and then but if you do that, continuous deployment to Azure doesn't die. So at the, as it dies. So at the moment, that caused me a fair bit of grief. So they're just two little things to be aware of. I'm sure Microsoft will address those um, quite quickly. Okay. So they they're just two things to be aware of if you're using Azure, GitHub, and continuous deployment. The other one is who uses Octopus Deploy. Who loves Octopus Deploy? More people loved Octopus Deploy than are using Octopus Deploy. That's pretty cool. Um, now, there's, there's, so this is not an Octopus Deploy issue. This is a, another vNext issue, is that Octopus Deploy works with NuGet packages. Okay? But according to the NuGet spec, it doesn't accept empty folders. So when, a, when you deploy an ASP.NET project to Octopus Deploy, what it does is it packages up the project into a NuGet package, but it leaves out any empty folders. When you go to then deploy that using Octopus, it dies. Um, Vnext, ASP.NET will not run because it's expecting those folders to be there. So if you are in that situation where we're about to set up ASP.NET and Octopus, um, I've, because we, we've got inside information, they're actually going to have, actually, they have an answer coming. I don't know if I can talk about what the answer is. There is another answer that is not using NuGet. Or you can ping me, because what we actually did was we added a script that actually goes through and just puts a text file in those empty folders before we package it up, which then fixes it. So there are a few things that cause me grief around ASP.NET that I, I just wanted to save you some time. Um, you know, rather than all of these things are, once you know the answer, they're not a problem, but finding the answer is often difficult. Um, my next tip is you've got to love the command line. Um, 
there are many things, especially large file copy operations. If you go and you do an NPM restore, um, if you do, sorry, if you do restore and you get package, I call it an NPM restore. If you restore and you get packages in Visual Studio, that can actually freeze up the IDE for a little while. It's often easy to do that kind of thing. Jump to the, you know, actually, if you set up, I'm going to do a blog post on this, or a Duncan will. I've got it set up. Watch this. If I'm in Visual Studio, I go Alt Space. It opens my command line, and I can go npm restore, and it's going to restore all my packages. Oh. npm install, and that's restoring all my npm packages. Okay, and my IDE is for it's up to date. Um, it doesn't freeze up my IDE. There's heaps of those things that if you do them in Visual Studio, it's going to slow down your IDE. So embrace the command line, get a cool command line tool, and learn to love the command line. Um, especially with large scale file operations like gulp, DNU restore. Um, so, pain, so there's other pain points I had that you shouldn't have now is that there was incompatible versions between betas. Um, and there was pain with every different beta had a lot of breaking changes. Um, but hopefully now we're going we're gonna to be at RC2 soon, so we're almost at release. So I think this is the time where you could actually, if you're starting a new project, I would be going file new project on the next version of ASP.NET. Um, so what I'm just going to very briefly talk about, because there's pizzas on the desk and I can see everyone's about to stampede me, um, is what's next. Now, there is a lot, the, the JavaScript community is moving, you know, moves through tooling fast. <coughs> there are new things coming. Um, we've already seen Grunt, no one's using Grunt, everyone's using Gulp. Um, and you'll see a lot of chatter online about, as I've said, sometimes we're, we're now moving, Bower is awesome, and we've used Bower with YDEP really, really, really well. But on very simple projects, we're just using NPM to go and get our client libraries. There are, you'll see there's other tooling around like JSPM and Webpack uh, around JavaScript tooling. There is a whole lot of new tooling coming around. Um, but what we're saying at the moment is, here is our recommendations. What you've got to learn today, NPM is here to stay. You've got to learn, NPM is going to be used for more and more and more. Really get into NPM, learn how to use Gulp, and Bower is great, it's really common, and it only takes an hour to get your head around. So when you're starting your new projects, I would definitely be getting your head around NPM, Gulp, and Bower. Um, things to keep an eye on if you're looking at being up to date with what might be coming down the track is .NET Core, Polymer, JSPM, and Webpack. And don't worry about Gulp. Gulp has been completely superseded. Um, another thing just, now that we're able to target um, Linux, um, keep an eye out for Docker and uh, containerization. Um, it's going to be the way of the future. Tonight, what we've talked about, we've, we had a trip down memory lane, we talked about the cool new features in ASP.NET, what you have to get your head around, what really hurt, and what, what's coming up next. Thank you everyone for coming along, and uh, I hope you enjoy the pizzas. <laughs>